So did, did your love of horse racing ever result in you actually getting involved as an owner? I've had bits and bobs of horses down the years, uh, shares with Jim Old, um, flat horses with some Art Prescott. Uh, the first one was called Quinn Sigimund and we bought it in its two year old career. It had plenty of runs and hadn't won anything. And at three, she won, she was second a couple of times, but she won four races in, in a row, I think. The first off 70 and the last off 65. Now, don't ask me how he did it, because most of us could get up, don't they? But somehow, the more it won, come down a pound every time. And of course, when it got to 65, I said to him, I'm taking this horse away, it's, it's deteriorated, <laughs> which he always loved. Um, and then we got another one that following, yeah, we sold that to Coolmore. Well, it went to the sales and Coolmore paid 28 grand for it or something like that. We paid 13 between about six of us. And then we got another one, a two-year-old, and it didn't run, didn't run. Um, and then it came out in the autumn and won two in a couple of weeks. And I said, right, so Mark, that's great, let's sell her. Can't sell that, never pass a bed. I've never took sat and step in its life. I didn't stop him winning. And anyway, the following year, I think I'm probably allowed to tell the story. It got a bit lost, shall we say, and ran up a sequence of noughts. And you might, if if you had inquired of some art how it was going to run today at Haydog, he might have answered, well, it'll be between 8th and 11th, Mr. Dan. And because you wouldn't ask and he wouldn't say that. Anyway, come the day is, I think it's a Monday or Tuesday after the Air Gold Cup meeting, Leicester. And there are sort of words in the air that might run a bit better. So we all go to Leicester and all have our boots on this thing. 20 year old runner, six furlong sprint. Uh, anyway, cut on three, so she's murdered four lengths by one of Mick Easterby's that he's been stopping even longer than anyone else had. Something that failed to get in the silver cup of air. So, a bit de deflating because we really had had a bit of a go at our own little level. I think David Ashwell's still paying. Um, so it goes home and I ring some heart and even say, well, bad luck and blah, blah, blah. Um, and he says, well, she's all right in the morning, she goes to Nottingham. Says, what? No, she goes to Nottingham tomorrow, she'll be fine. So off she goes to Nottingham. None of us go, because we haven't got the bus fare between us, and then the back of it, and of course she bolts up. And clearly the plan had been to win two in 24 hours. Um, and I remember reading George Duffield and saying, I'm sorry, George, you weren't there today. Well done, thank you in March. I said, the reason we weren't there is we all had our brains on yesterday. And he said, hmm, so did I. <laughs> Has punting been a big part of your No, life? I've never been a big punter. I've, I've written, no, I'm a real cucumber sandwich with the crusts off punter compared with youngsters today. Um, I don't think I've ever had more than 300, 400. I think once I had 300, 400 quid in the horse. I mean, I'm a 50 quid, 100 quid punter. Um, you know, I've had lots of children and bills to pay and educations and divorces, for well, one. Um, you have to do all that stuff before you, you know, and we're not, we're not merchant bankers or hedge fund managers, you know, we've got Range Rover out the front or money to burn. Now you can I like, don't get me wrong, I like a bet, particularly over jumps, but it's never been a matter of life and death. And it has always frightened the life out of me. As youngsters coming up in the trade, the sums of money they're betting. But I keep, nowadays when there was such things in the form, but I use it to keep the door open. I've never spent 10 minutes with those in the form of my life. I'm Gus the Guesser. But after a long time in the game, you can kind of work out what people are up to or what they think their horse is capable of. And you tend to back trainers 
really, at the end of the day. Yeah. You run into the odd horse, you think, you see it young, like I saw Hardy Eustace young and thought, now that is a proper horse. Um, I suppose the current lot I latched on very early to Kalashnikov if he's going to fulfil his. So that was painful when he got beat at Cheltenham, too. But, you know, Dawn Run I was on to very early for various reasons. Um, so those sort of horses, I am a follower over cliffs, but funnily enough, I can also spot one and be right about it, but desert it too early. But I, it's, it's either feast or famine, either follow them over cliffs or get out too soon, and both are as annoying as each other. Now you mentioned Cheltenham several times, that's a massive part of your life. It is. Um, I live on half an hour from Cheltenham, I have been for 32 years down here. Um, I was captivated by it as a child, watching it in black and white. My mum and dad used to go for a couple of days. They always came back having had a riot. Um, and I've just, everything about it. But, you know, I grew up to that O'Sullivan, it was, what, eight when Arkle departed the scene. Or, um, so I go all the way back to that early 60s stuff. Um, and Cheltenham, it's just fascinated me from a child. And I first went when I was 19. We had a, I had a box, would you believe? I think I'm the only person who was, I think, on, at the time on Social Security. Um, who's ever had a box at Cheltenham. And the box was right on the winning post in what used to be the old newsstand, uh, now thankfully gone. Um, and it was a friend's box, a friend of my father's, and they couldn't use it. So Dad said, look, this fellow said, would, would you like it? And I said, oh, yes, please. So it was a box for 12, I suppose. Viewing air out the front, corridor, dining bit. Um, so we couldn't have, none of us could have fallen in a square piece of handbrake, guineas, or whatever it was. So I just said to him, well, bring plenty of booze in your pockets and we'll buy the mixers and things like that. I think we had about 42 people in this spot. It was like the Black Hole Car Castle. And in those days, of course, people were drinking rousers. There were various women folk there for other reasons. They were sort of more interested in picking them from the, from the residents of the box and the horses. But... I think Willie Wumpkin, we had information of Willie Wumpkin's and women, which he did at 33, so like, I ignored. We had a lot of good information came into that box that day. Uh, we made money. Um, there were some interesting characters in there, including the man who devised the blueprint and bought us the Olympics in 2012. Um, a lot of bright young people on their way up the ladder. All, we were all late teens, early twenties. Um, and I think four of them woke up in a siding in Paddington at about five in the morning and swore they'd never go to Cheltenham again. Um, it was an absolute riot and we caused chaos in this box. All the people, we had a large gentleman from Samoa who went on to make a fortune in the computer business. And he was an enthusiastic consumer of what are known as spliffs. And he just, he was, he was known as the large Indian because he was a Samoan sort of fellow. He should have been known as the large Samoan, I'm sure. And he just spent the afternoon um, standing on the balcony, surveying the scene which he absolutely adored, smoking these enormous things like sort of First World War siege guns. And the smoke drifted all the way down across the Great and Good and Tweed. I remember Peter Cundall was in the next box. I don't suppose he's ever had an experience like it. Um, but it was very much like that. Um, but God, it was fun. And uh, I haven't missed days since, I've never had a box in my home since. That sounds pretty memorable, but what would you say the most memorable day of sport at Cheltenham has been for you? And I know that's pretty difficult to pick. Uh, oh God. Diddly dumb. The, uh, the most memorable race for me would be Dawn Run's Gold Cup. Um, it had everything. I, if I had desert island races, I think most of them would be um, staying chases. Dawn Runs Gold Cup was just an unbelievable P 
piece of theatrical drama. Um, but I was also there for all those Sea Pigeon, Night Nurse, Monksfield renewals. And they were absolutely fabulous. I mean, year after year, people talk about the golden age of hurdling. It was, it absolutely was. Not because they all won three each, like so many have, um, but because the, you just did not know which one it was going to be this year. And they were all utterly different horses. Night Nurse, a big chasing type. Monks where you could train through a polo mint. And Sea Pigeon, this enormous talent, which had to be finessed. Um, and Julie was. I, those were great years, I think. They'd been famous punching days when you've been right about something for a couple of months. Um, and famous disasters. Uh, and the disasters are always better than that. They always hear about people making a few quid, but uh, Norton's coin was a disaster because I'd become convinced in January, I think, that Norton's coin was a certainty at Charlton for the Mild Mayo Fleet. And I remember, uh, it must have been the sort of five day time. I'd never smoked Silgrass in my life, never heard of it. I couldn't, wouldn't be able to recognise it, but I was absolutely convinced, because handicaps Cheltenham are my thing, I was absolutely convinced this would win. And I'd been telling everyone from January through to March, this is the one thing you've got to back at Cheltenham is Norton's coin. When the mum left me. Anyway, come to sort of Dex time, I rang Cyril Griffiths, just check horse were right. And, and he, I'll never forget, he said, oh, it's market day today. He says, uh, and I, I missed the entry for the mile with me, so he's, he's going in the Gold Cup. I slammed, thank you, Mr. Gordon. I slammed my phone down. And there were about three or four. I said, that runny Gold Cup. Well, of course, nobody's going to back in the Gold Cup. Um, but two out, my great friend, the late Neil Cook, who was also in on, had been in on the other gamble, just turned to me and says, oh, so I really don't think you want to watch this. But one of my oldest chums, who was not a keen racing man, um, rang me late that night and said, I've just fulfilled a lifetime's ambition. I've been into the, I think it was the White Bear at Shipston, which would have had Cheltenham Week, a couple hundred people in. I bought everybody a drink, because he had backed it, because he'd never mild mail fleet from, you know, the, the, Blackwall Tunnel. Um, so a couple of people did have bright touches on the thing, but I wasn't one of them. Oh. Well, I've, I've read somewhere that you would like your ashes scattered at Cheltenham. Well, if, they let, if they've got a sort of big enough area to put them, I suppose. Uh, yeah, top of the hill. Top of the hill where it's all... Where you've got that view actually up to the stands and it, it's this and then that. And the race is yet to unfold. So between now and then, if you back the winner of the derby at 100 to 1, are you going to change it to Tatman Corner? No, no, no. Good Lord. Can't wash your mouth out with bleach. Certainly not. <laughs>